Hey, this is Scott Purdue, and I'm here with Colin Wills, and we're going to talk Spitfire today, so stick with us on Flywire. Hey, today on Flywire, we're going to talk about uh, a Spitfire Mark IX that was built right at the end of the war that Colin's restoring. It's a Tango Echo 566, and uh, it's got a really interesting story, and we're actually going to do a series of videos about the restoration of this airplane to, to flying shape. So the first question that comes to mind, Colin, is why, why a uh, Spitfire? Why did you want to do this? Um, well, I mean, apart from the fact that the Spitfire is, is well, it's an iconic aeroplane um, in, uh, in the Battle of Britain for, for us Brits, um, as probably the Mustang is for, for, for you guys in America. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, every, um, of my age, every boy's dream was always, oh, the Spitfire was the thing you posted on the wall, the Spitfire was the model aeroplane you made. Um, and uh, it's, it's not something that comes uh, along very often um, to have the opportunity to, um, you know, get involved in the renovation of a, of a, a basically a historic icon. So, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I've, um, you know, like you, um, had a steerman, or have a steerman, and uh, was involved in the restoration of it. And uh, the restoration for, for my steerman was pretty much done down at Enstone in the UK with a guy called Tom Gilbert. <clears throat> now, Tom, Tom has... Um, you know, it's kind of like Mr. Stearman in the UK. I mean, he's done many, many restorations. He's a young guy, um, and uh, he, this, he pretty much is the, the go-to guy in the UK for, for Stearmans. And he was doing some work for um, um, a chap at um, the uh, Retro Air and Track, the place is called, and that's where they renovate uh, Merlin engines. They do that for the Battle of Britain Memorial flight. And it came about that um, this guy, he... Um, he had a, a Spitfire, um, a TE-566, in his shop, sitting there waiting to be renovated. Tom asked him if he wanted to sell it. Turned out to the, you know, he liked Tom, and he said, yeah, fair enough. So Tom came to me, I had the money, and, um, you know, between us, you know, both Tom and I, you know, got the um, aircraft and started the renovation. And that's pretty much how it started and how it came about. So it's kind of like through my involvement, really, with... Um, the uh, steerman and being involved in the restoration of the steerman, I was very much hands-on. Um, but Tom thought, well, he's a good dude, you know. He'll, um, he'll, he'll. I can work with him. Let's do a Spitfire together because I think that relationship between restorer and owner has got to be a good one. Otherwise, there can be quite a lot of upset and what have you. So we we kind of got on well when we did the steerman. So there's no reason why um, we we won't get on well with the um, Spitfire. Okay. Well, that sounds that's fascinating. Yeah, and you do need. You need a good relationship to have a successful restoration, I think, because uh, it's always going to take longer and cost more than you thought at first. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're also going to get many, many problems, um, you know, with the restoration. Like, uh, you know, so, so far we've got things like D-boxes are underway, <clears throat> or the D-boxes are now complete, fuselage is there. And, um, you know, I mean, a typical example here was we had a... Um, one, one guy building the D-boxes and another company building the fuselage. And of course, um, two different companies, one hasn't to accept the work of another company. And there was kind of like a bit of a, bit of a struggle about D-boxes and D-boxes fitting, uh, the spars fitting into the, into the fuselage. It's, it's a, I don't know whether you know, uh, well, whether your listeners know much about a Spitfire um, spar, um, but it's, <clears throat> it's quite interesting because it's made up basically of channels um, and tubes that basically go into each other and progressively get smaller as they go out. One at the top, one at the bottom, and then it basically fits into the side. Big bolts go in and that holds it into shape. But the idea is that it's it's not um, it's not a, a box section. It lit literally is these two two sections that go top and bottom of the. Uh, and of course, it's a great idea in a lot of ways because of course it's not going to completely snap or break. It's going to deform. So if you over G the airplane or something happens, then you've still got you know, you're likely to be able to bring the, the pilot and the aeroplane home safe. Um, but yeah, we had sort of like issues with that and they're not fitting, we had to test fit them and stuff like that. But, you know, we're, we're kind of like, we're on the way with it and um, we'll see how it progresses. Well, it's, 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 it is an exciting thing to do, but you're also doing something special with this. This is a Mark IX made right at the end of the war and you're going to do something different with the airplane than just a plain restoration. Yeah. Well, you, the 
needed to say, a Spitfire is a single-seat aeroplane. The Mark IX was, um, I think most Spitfire pilots thought that the Mark IX was the best spit. It had the power. It was much, um, it, 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 it could compete with the, the um, Fokker Wolf 190. So they, everybody says that the Mark IX was about the best one. The problem is, you know, I'm not a young guy anymore. And if I'm going to fly this Spitfire, um, more than likely it's probably going to get ahead of me at some stage. So we're building it as a T9. The T9 was the trainer version. So it's not as elegant, but effectively what the T9 is, it's a two-seater. So you can only do that with a Mark 9. You can't do it with any other type. It has to be the Mark 9. That's the only one that it's, 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 um, has the, uh, you're allowed to do it with. And, of course, it means that you've got the canopy at the front and you've got a bubble canopy at the back. It's what they use as well for taking people for rides, commercialising the, the Spitfire. Um, so for me, it's a case of, you know, at least I can always have a Czech pilot in the back, some young guy that is um, pretty switched on. So if I forget something, they're there to, to put me right. And, of course, you know, flying single-seat uh, single airplanes is, after a while, it gets a bit lonely. It's nice to share an experience. And, you know, to be able to share the flight in the Spitfire is quite something, really. Yeah, absolutely. The the thing about a single seat airplane is, you you said it hit the nail right on the head. You can't share it. I mean, only so much you can do and go fly in formation by yourself. And you know, it, it it's fun to fly, but then yeah, but the real fun is actually sharing it with somebody else. Yeah, yeah, no, totally agree. Now, I mean, um, you know, that's that's exactly how I feel about it. I mean, um, you want to go and experience aerobatics or do aerobatics or something like that, and it's just nice to take people up. I mean, I I, I, I get a great deal of pleasure. Um, from taking people up in an airplane that haven't really flown before. And, you know, it kind of, uh, their reactions relights the flame inside of me that what I first felt when I first went flying and enjoyed flying. And that's great, you know. That's what, that's what, I, that's what I like. Yeah. And uh, so you're going to operate the Spitfire off mostly grass fields in in the UK. Yeah, I very much doubt we will, um, well, we will be operating off a grass field. I think a grass field for tail draggers is a lot more forgiving. I know over here, Definitely it's, that. It's, it's, you know, over here you're all hard runways. And well, there's, there's grass, but not as many grass fields as there. Yeah. But. but the other thing as well is your grass fields tend to be quite dry and hard. Our grass fields tend to be very lush and slippery. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't quite get it right on the landing. It's, you know, you're, it's a, uh, grass field is definitely more forgiving for, for tail draggers in my view. Every time I've landed on a with a tail dragger on a on a hard runway, you know, there's always that, you know, and you're on the pedals, you're trying to keep it straight. It always makes me nervous. I'll always take a grass runway over a hard runway for a tail dragger all day long. Not so much for for trike undercarriages, but tail draggers definitely. I'll go for a grass runway, and I mean the intention will be that we'll operate the spit off of grass runways. Having said that, the, you can't get away from the fact you're going to have to put it down on a hard runway. But I always would feel more comfortable on grass. Yeah. Well, and you also get that feel like it's the Battle of Britain and, you know, you're not a scramble. So. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the fortunate thing for those guys, though, back then, is they had big fields to work from, you know. They could point it into wind any direction. Um, you know, uh, in the UK, well, you've flown in the UK and you're going to come again, hopefully, this year to do some more flying in the UK. But um, our grass fields are generally in one direction. They're around about 30 metres wide and, um, you know, not particularly long. So, you know, we're always, you know, you've got to be pretty accurate. You know, it's, it's not, um, you know, you don't have, you know, vast acres of fields to uh, deal with a sort of slight deviation, etc., like they did in the war. That was, yeah. uh, well, the first grass, uh, when I was stationed at Lake and Heath, um, the first time we went, uh, I, I went and met people at Swanton Morley, which was a grass field and happened to be the first uh, airport where the Army Air Corps made the first combat sortie from is mm -hmm. Swanton Morley. They borrowed some uh, uh, um, Buccaneers, I can't remember exactly. It's a, a bomber, tailwheel, Hudson's is what we used later, is what we call them, but they were loaned, you know, one of the lend lease yep. things for the RAF, and the RAF loaned them to the Americans to go do the first bombing run mm. out of Swanton Morley. But what it was, was it was a, like a great big amoeba. It was like this circled table, but a, you know, sort of odd shape on the end. So yeah, you can land in any direction. Yeah. Whatever the wind is, you can land there. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much the same kind of feel they had back, back in, the, in World War II. Yeah. And that was, I think, that you, you could say that I mean, when I've um, watched um, uh, you know, clips from um, and pictures of the training bases that they had in the U.S. for the Stearmans, they were this great big wheel of concrete 
Yeah, concrete or asphalt. My dad, yeah. my dad went through uh, steering training in Memphis in the Navy, and it was, it was literally just a big uh, asphalt round circle. Yeah. And they landed into the wind. And they landed what? into the wind, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't see, um, and my airstrip at home is, um, you know, often I'll get a crosswind and landing the steerman in a crosswind. It's not ideal. It's not ideal. I don't like doing it, I have to say. Um, but you know what? It, it teaches you what your feet are for um, and using those differential brakes. So it's, I guess it, you know, it keeps you on your toes and especially sort of leading into a Spitfire. I'm not suggesting that the Steerman is the ideal vehicle to then jump into a Spitfire from. Um, but it's certainly, you know, keeping your, 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 um, you know, your, your feet on your, t you know, keeping the aeroplane in a straight line, feet on your toes and all that kind of stuff is, is important. But we'll see. I have yet to do sort of um, some transitioning into a Spitfire. I probably will fly the Harvard. A lot of people say that the aircraft to actually fly before a Spitfire is a chipmunk, believe it or not. Mm. The old RAF chipmunk. They say it's a better, it's a better feel than it would be a Harvard. But I kind of feel you've got to fly the Harvard heavier aeroplane because the Spitfire is quite a heavy and powerful aeroplane. Yeah, heavily heavy and powerful. And so what I found about the... Uh, about the T6, the Harvard, is that it's a heavier airplane, so it's doing all the tail dragger stuff, but you don't actually notice it like you do if you're in a Stearman or a Cub, you know, that it happens right now and you've got a little bit of time to fix it. By the time you notice it, if you're not paying attention and then you notice it in the T6, it's almost too late mm. because it's bigger. Mm. So it, it generally twice, as a matter of fact, I think the T6 is twice the weight of a Stearman. So the inertia of it, you know, doing a, you know, start to swerve once it's going and you notice it, nah, it's a bit too late, so. Yeah, I think you've got a very wide, it's quite a wide undercarriage on a T6, isn't it, the Harvard? It's fairly wide, isn't it? Much wider than I think the Spitfire. It, <clears throat> it might be wider than the Spitfire, but, uh, you know, what they say once people are flying Mustangs, they say it's a great trainer for the T6. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. Because the, the gear is very narrow. Mm. on a T6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always wonder, I mean, gosh, you know, can you imagine the ME109? That gear, wow. That gear with the, uh, it's angled. I know. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, they, 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 they what, crosswind? Yeah. That would be disastrous. Yeah, it must have been a hard, very hard airplane to fly, that ME109. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Yeah, I think in some respects, the Stearman is quite, um, you know, because the Stearman's pretty narrow gear, and she has this real tendency to, to rock. Um, I think, you know, the Stearman is probably not a bad shout for... Oh, I agree. I think the Stearman is... Yeah. If I'm a good pilot at all, it's because I fly Stearman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, I just love it. I love that airplane. Mm -hmm. So, but it was, you were talking, we were talking earlier, and this is just one of the things we're going to talk about. I want to do a series of videos here mm -hmm. uh, on, the, uh, on the restoration and the flying and the training and all that stuff. So it, it's going to take a while to do these yeah. because it's about 18 months or so. Well, no, I mean, the total build are probably is over three years, right. but we are 18 months into it now. Yeah. So things like the engine's been rebuilt, uh, fuselage is now uh, pretty much complete. Um, most, of the, um, tail f most of the feathers, tail feathers, flaps, etc., are all done. But we still have yet to, we've still got the back end of the wings to build, so we've got to put the back end of the wings on, and that's got to be done. Um, and then, of course, we've got to pull it all together get it down to Endstone and assemble it and then start doing all the plumbing and getting all that done. So there's going to be a good 18 months. I think we've probably got at least 18 months to go before we're complete. Yeah. But hopefully next time you come over to the UK, you'll be able to see a bit more progression yeah. and share it hopefully with, the, with your viewers. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So we actually went and looked at the, uh, what was the name of the airframe? Air, air, um, oh gosh, um, airframe assemblies. Airframe, airframe assemblies on the Isle of Wight. Yep. Sand down on the Isle of Wight. And a fantastic organization. Oh, it was amazing. I was totally unprepared to film that place. Mm -hmm. But I did get a little bit of video and stuff, and I'm going to run that in maybe the next video. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as we build on this thing. Yeah. So um, look forward to that stuff. But one of the things that we were talking earlier was is prop. You said they had a, there's an outfit in England that <clears throat> made yeah, new yeah. props. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, really. Um, all of the Spitfires in the UK... Um, are actually flying a German propeller. Um, and you can't, I think uh, the, the, the thing with those propellers, you can't actually run the engines at full power, it's sort of because of those propellers. But um, um, unless somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what my understanding is. But now there is an outfit in the UK that is actually building the propellers that they had on the original Spitfires. So we should be able to run the engine at uh, its full capacity and what have you. So it's the proper propeller for a Spitfire. So it's a British-made propeller. 
So the Mark 9, did it use metal props or were they wood? Um, I think the Mark 9 was metal props. You know, you have to correct, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but no, it's a, a metal three-bladed prop um, on that, you know, constant speed prop. Yeah, well, the first the first bits, Mark 1s and I think 2s and maybe even to the 5s, they were, they were wood, but the first one was a two-blade. It was yes. just a two-blade air screw. Yeah, yeah. It didn't look much of an airplane, really, did it? No, it did. It, it, it was kind of like something's wrong with that airplane. Yeah, yeah. You kind of expected it on the sort of the front of a spad from the First World War or something. It was a big spinner and a big wooden prop. But, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I think the um, you know, like I say, I think the you know the Mark Ones, the smaller engine, um, you know, to the, the Mark Five, much more economical, I guess, to run. But then the Mark Nine, you know, had the bigger engine. And uh, away we're going to be putting a Packard Merlin into this Spitfire because Packards are easier to find spares for. Because, I mean, with any sort of old airplane, it's finding the spares. Finding parts is a big deal. He's talking about the Packard Merlin, which was license-built from Rolls-Royce here in the United States. And you put them in the Mustangs, didn't you? The yeah. Airplane, which yeah. made the Mustang quite an airplane, I believe. Well, the, the interesting thing about that is is it had an Allison. And uh, when we, we actually built the Mustang for the RAF, that's what it was originally designed for, not for the Army Air Corps. It was built for the RAF, and they put an Allison in it, and it was a ground attack airplane. And then over there, you guys, uh, I think down at Farnborough, the, the, uh, uh, where they do all the research and yeah. testing and stuff, they go, hey, you know what? This might work if we, how about if we put a Rolls-Royce Merlin in this, you know, put the spit engine in it and see what it does, and it just transformed the airplane. Mm -hmm. And so that happened, they tested it, and then uh, that, then the Air Force bought it in huge numbers, and Packard started making it in license built, so it was huge. I mean, I, I have to say, the Mustang, um, you know, I was, li like you, I did, a, I did an honorary commander role at um, Lake and Heath. I was at Lake and Heath, or as a, as a, as a um, 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 we, we called it the British American Committee. It was kind of like liaison. Um, with the uh, um, the um, Americans and the, and the and the and the Brits to make sure that we, you know, the pajama, uh, pajama and the tomato tomato and you know, all that kind of thing sort of didn't sort of roll into pubs and bars and stuff like that. So it was very much a you know let's see how we all fit into the, uh, the UK environment. Um, um, but I, I I had the pleasure of being the honorary commander of the 493rd um, Fighter Squadron, and my call sign um, as they decided to name me was Mustang. So I do actually have an affinity to the Mustang and I would very much, you know, I kind of think that maybe after the spit I might go for a Mustang. I do like the Mustang. I think it is a, a very, uh, you know, that's just an iconic aeroplane. Well, I agree with you. I love the Mustang. Yeah. Absolutely. My favorite. One of these days I'll get to fly a Mustang. I think that's, that would be, uh, I think that's what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to fly one, go to fly one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. So, Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks like a bit like that over there. And my Patreon supporters, I'd like to thank you guys uh, up here uh, for your support. And stay tuned. There's going to be more to come on it sporadically. I'm not going to put this out necessarily on schedule or anything. But more to come on uh, 566, uh, See, 566 yeah. as we go. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.